Hello, friends. It's a good day. Good day to be alive. I hope our lives are filled with praise and thanksgiving. I did not go to the street today. It was raining this morning, and I still have this cough that may come up, but at least I can throw away this video if my cough happens, and we can start over. So I didn't go to the street because it's hard to stop and start over on the street. Next week, maybe. Another thing is I've got a, a book signing for tomorrow afternoon. And so I'm kind of excited about that. Today, we are looking at Matthew again. Matthew 2, starting with verse 12. 12 to 14 and 19 to 21, and then Matthew 27. I'm glad to see you. I hope you're having a great day and we'll have a good week. So let's pray before we read. God in heaven, we honor you, we thank you. We praise you for your Bible. We thank you for the stories of Jesus. And we ask that you will be here right now Help us understand and help us to find our gratitude, our worship, and our joy in you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Matthew 2, 12 to 14. And being warned of God in a dream that they should not return to Herod, they departed into their own country another way. And when they were departed, behold, the angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and flee into Egypt, and be there until I bring you word. For Herod will seek the young child to destroy him. When he arose, he took that young child and his mother by night, and departed into Egypt. 19. When Herod was dead, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Arise, and take the young child and his mother, and go into the land of Israel, for they are dead who sought the young child's life. And he arose, and took the young child and his mother, and came into the land of Israel. Then all the way over to Matthew 27, Matthew 27, 17 to 19. Matthew 27, 17. Therefore, when they were gathered together, Pilate said to them, Whom will you that I should release to you, Barabbas or Jesus, which is called the Christ? For he knew that for envy they had delivered him. When he was set down on the judgment seat, his wife said to him, saying, Have nothing to do with that just man, for I have suffered many things this day in a dream because of him. There was a dream that repeated over and over for me in my young adulthood. In my dream, I was in the house of my before four years of life, life. The house with the scary basement and the outhouse where you could hear the nighttime dogs barking in the distance. In my dream, I was upstairs in that house going into the half gable closet of one of the gable rooms. In my dream, I knew there was a secret door near the end of that closet. I opened the secret door and slipped into the dark. I knew the way. Soon I entered a wide room that served as entrance to a wide hallway, stretching on in the dark. I followed the hallway, feeling along its walls, once in a while stumbling over a pipe or package of something. I knew the way. I had been there before, 
and had turned back at some point each time. This time it seemed important for me to keep going. Finally, after a long, long time walking, and when the hallway had narrowed into a tunnel of which I could touch both sides, I saw a dim light up ahead. It seemed a long way to the light, and then I looked into a room carved out of the rock that had held the tunnel. The room was dimly lit, and a family was sitting around the table. I saw, and I left to retrace my steps, returning past the pipe and the package and all the turns I remembered. Finally, I came to the wide room and found my way back to the secret door and into the half gable closet. I dreamed it a few times like that, enough to recognize each turn and space and find some solace in the recognition then the dream changed. It was the same door, hallway, little light, and room at the end. This time, I stepped inside and curled myself small against a wall of the room. The people saw me, smiled, and went about their conversation. I felt safe. I felt seen. I felt accepted for whoever I was. I stayed for a long time, and then I left and returned by the same turns and spaces that I knew so well. I do not think I ever ate with the family or conversed with them. I was simply there and accepted by them. I dreamed it a few times like that. The dreams got farther and farther apart in time, but I never forgot the way. Then, one time the dream changed. While going down that wide, long, dark hallway, I came around a turn to see the side of the wall broken out. I could see sunshine through the break and trees and colors. I did not go on to sit with the family that time, but I pondered the break in my tunnel. I think it was a long time before I had the next dream. This time, there was no little rock-walled room at the end. The entire end of the tunnel was opened up to the sunshine. Out on the land, earth movers and bulldozers were scurrying about doing work to prepare for construction. I never had that dream again. I know what the dream meant. I was in a time of deep depression. For me, the proverbial light at the end of the tunnel had gone out. I now believe God used the dream to say, help save my life and as a testimony afterward that it was God who was at work. God used dreams of warning to save the life of Jesus as a child and to testify of his life at the end. Now we will turn to the Bible stories of dreams in our readings for today. When Herod the king heard from the wise men of the east that there might be a newborn king of the Jews, he lost his fragile sense of security and sent soldiers into Bethlehem to sweep up all the babies in massacre so as to be sure to kill the primary one. God used a dream to tell the wise men not to report back to Herod after having find, found the child. God also used a dream to tell Joseph 
Jesus' earthly father, to leave Bethlehem immediately. These two dreams saved the child's life. Two warning dreams protected the life of this child amidst the terrifying jealousy of Herod the king. When Pilate, the Roman governor, looked at Jesus and tried all human ways to save him from the treachery of his enemies, Pilate received a message from his wife. Apparently, Pilate had been called from his bedroom early in the morning and had left his wife asleep. Pilate's wife is the one God chose to warn through a dream. In the midst of Pilate's dithering, he received a warning message from his wife. I have suffered much in a dream on account of this man, she wrote. Do not touch him. This dream did not save the life of the man, Jesus. This warning dream was recorded in the gospel message and told always with the story of Jesus' death as a testimony that God will warn people, even people not openly following him. God used dreams to protect Jesus' life. God used dreams to protect the lives of a whole kingdom and the ancestors of the Jewish nation. Joseph was familiar with dreams. He had two dreams as a child that meant something. He solved two troubling dreams for his colleagues in jail. Then, when the pharaoh of Egypt had two dreams that turned out to be warnings, Joseph knew why the dream was doubled and had come twice to pharaoh. The doubling indicated that in God's intentions, the thing in the dream was sure and soon. We have begun studying the phrases that Matthew wrote twice. Who knows? Perhaps there is a sure and soon facet to them. We found God is with us at the beginning and ending of Matthew's gospel. Next, we found King of the Jews just inside the first set. Third, we found dreams of warning inside both of the other two sets of two. These three, God is with us, King of the Jews, and dreams of warnings, constitute the introduction to our studies. They tell us God is with us as King of the universe and wants to make himself known. The way we can know these three as the introduction comes in a delightful habit Matthew had of marking his sections. After every sermon or discourse Matthew recorded from Jesus, he inserted the same phrases as markers. It happened when Jesus finished. From this we know that Matthew's Jesus gave five sermons with narrative happenings, that's happenings in between the sermons. The first and last narrative happenings tell of Jesus' birth and beginnings on the one hand and Jesus' death and resurrection on the other hand, producing the introduction and conclusion to Matthew's gospel. They are bounded by the first and last sermons. They tell us God is with us as king of the universe and wants to make himself known. Those five sermons and interluding narrative happenings make up the body of the story. I want you to see some very interesting things about those five sermons and thereby about the treasure of Jesus as shown in Matthew's doubles. The first of the five sermons is what we call the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus declares the principles of the kingdom of heaven. The last of the five sermons consists of promises and parables of readiness for the kingdom of heaven. 
Sermon number two sends Jesus' disciples out on mission. Sermon number four describes the church's mission. Those three doubles that we have found already, which tell us God is with us as king of the universe and wants to make himself known, those showed up in envelope-within-envelope envelope pattern. One set of doubles is set in the text within the other set of doubles. Now we can notice that the whole structure of Matthew follows the same pattern. Sermons 2 and 4 match each other in some ways and stand within Sermons 1 and 5, which also match each other in some ways. Because of these hints at pattern, and having already discovered more than 100 doubles in Matthew, I wanted to see if any of the doubles fit the pattern. I will tell you now, the project was not simple, yet it is well worth your reading Matthew over and over again in order to participate. Let me illustrate the pattern in a couple more ways. In my dream, which I told you at the beginning of this chapter, I went through the door down into a wide room and hallway, past some pipes, toward a room at the end of the tunnel. Then I returned, recognizing each turn and space on the way back, gaining some sort of comfort from each notice of deja vu. This may be how it is with the reading of Matthew. In the first half of the book, things feel strange. Then in the second half, we begin to recognize phrases and gain some comfort and courage to read again. Another illustration will better suffice to carry us through all the doubles. Imagine Matthew as a mountain. You read up one side and reach the peak, which turns out to be the sermon about listening to Jesus' parables in Matthew 13. Then you read down the mountain, meeting again the themes that led to the peak. We will have at our command a metaphorical he helicopter so we can peek around the mountain to compare both sides. Now with all this fun of reading to the peak of Matthew, up and down the flanking phrases, I must warn you, that there are other ways of viewing Matthew. There is another outline, which we will study later to learn more about those more than 100 doubles in Matthew. Furthermore, it is not even necessary to notice the patterns for receiving the joy of the stories and sermons of Jesus in the gospel written by Matthew. But will you read Matthew with me? You will understand that God is with us as king of the universe and wants to make himself known. He will make himself known and near by any means he can, even possibly by dreams of warning. Give him a chance, okay? So I want to pray for us. Lord God in heaven, King of the universe, the one who makes himself known to us, we worship you today. We come to you recognizing that you have the dominion and authority over all of us, over all the happenings on earth and everywhere in the universe. We honor and glorify you in that position. And we recognize that we often fail to honor and glorify you. We ask your forgiveness for the times when we have 
put someone else in place of you. When we have failed to turn to your word, to your answers, to our dilemmas. And when we have hurt others in our process of trying to fill our own needs. We ask for your forgiveness and we believe you bought it for us on Calvary and you offer it to us freely. And so in the joy of that forgiveness, standing before you free and clear right now, we come to you with our requests. There are requests that are close to us, deaths that have happened, losses, shortcomings of our own and of others, hurtful things that have happened to us, the temptation to turn out to be a victim, to make something of that, the, the shortfall of our resources, some of us have been sick or gone through operations. We're asking for healing. Lord, there are so many needs that are close to each of us. Please hear them now. Look in our minds. See who, who we care about. And send your angels to make yourself known to them. Lord, there are some of us who know friends who don't honor you, who don't put you first. We pray for them. We also pray, Lord, for ourselves as the things coming on the earth seem to get larger and larger. We ask for your presence on our universities, on our campuses, in our churches, in all the boardrooms where decisions are being made, in our schools and with our teachers. And Lord, there are so many who are in the paths of war right now. So many suffering from fear and from the losses, perhaps the loss of everything through war. I ask that you would stand by those suffering and those who are suffering from some other causes, fire, volcanoes, tornadoes, floods, mudslides. Lord, only you can restore to us the joy of your presence in the midst of our suffering. That's what we ask for. And we ask for your kingdom to come, your will to be done here on earth. We ask that the, the decisions that humans will make will be those that you can use to bring your kingdom. We ask for your second coming to be soon. And we ask for your courage and strength to pull us through the times that we think are coming. And so now, Lord, we thank you. We honor and praise you. We come to you with gratitude. And we will be praising you through all eternity. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, friends, I'm Wilma Zalabach, and I am with Grace Chapel Fellowship, a church to bless other churches where listening is our unity. And of course, I have those six imperatives that always come up in my preaching. One, God is good. Two, humans have been taken away from God and good. Three, Jesus came to bring us back. And four, I can't fix it. God can, and I decide 
to let God. And then two more. The Bible is worth reading, and the Sabbath is a gift worth remembering. So, until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you.